good at it. I can do a 30 square root in about three days by myself. Nice. Wow. And insulation. Nice. Okay, so we've, we've gone through uh, section one and two, um, and we're into, we're into 13.3 now, and the title of this is The Full Financial Costs of Energy Use. So, um, and there's, there's a lot of good language in here, but I'm going to grab a couple things. It says, energy systems are constantly evolving, we know that, uh, shaped by a variety of forces, Scientific, technological, economic, and political, of course. Uh, the next paragraph says, despite conflicting protestations about the true costs, and we were just looking at oil spills as a true cost, and benefit of or energy for use for growthists, peakists, and environmentalists, and I think you remember that from chapter one, there are many methodological uncertainties involved in, in establishing both the benefits and costs of energy use. So, again, you know, I, I mentioned money previously. No two people on this planet are going to value the same things in the same way, right? It's just, it's just a given. So, you know, true cost to one person might be something um, that had to been, you know, I don't know. Take, gosh, I don't know, take um, the passenger pigeon, for example. It would be, it would be in a, a pretty good one. There were, you know, billions of passenger pigeons flooding the skies in the 20s, 30s, etc. They were pooping on stuff, you know, messing up city. I, you know, I guess there were, there were problems with too many pat. Now they're gone, and it could, it could be that there's still people who said, Thank God those dang things are gone. Really rather, so there was no there was no cost. There was only a benefit to getting rid of the passenger pigeon. But on the other hand, you might have another subset of humanity that really valued the passenger pigeon and wish it was still around. So it, that's why they're saying here, how do you how do you figure out what the true cost is? Because it's, it's different for, for every single person. Okay. Well, that's a, all the the lawns and everything else is getting less natural natural fertilization. The passenger pigeons are gone. Oh, yeah. The, the come up and take the ones out of my barn. <laughs> <laughs> you got a pigeon or two uh, Shit, fertilizing your barn? Shit on the inside <laughs> of the barn. <laughs> Just put little grass. Anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a natural roof there. Just throw some seed up there. <laughs> okay. Um, energy subsidies, this gets kicked around a lot. I think I showed a picture of this um, not too long ago. I think it was an energy technology. Sorry, I think maybe I, maybe I lost track of it. I'll see it's down here somewhere. Oh, there it is. So here are federal subsidies, and I th think we looked at this briefly. Uh, so we can see that the um, direct spending and, and tax breaks are much bigger for fossil fuels. Uh, and smaller for renewable energy, but what this is this is not normalized on the you know a kill or on a per megajoule basis or a per kilowatt hour basis, right? So we'll, someone say, well, gosh, um, yeah, we're subsidized more because we make a lot more energy. Um, you know, you, you look at this map, you're like, okay, so three times, maybe four times more money. Oh no, um, I guess it's more than that. 7.2 7 versus 12.2, so uh, what is that, six times, approximately six times more money, but the fossil fuel industry says, well, but we make ten times more energy than you guys do, so we're actually on a, on a per energy unit basis, 
we're not getting as much. And that's typically the argument. But then you say, well, what are, what are, what are you costing the environment is, is, the, is the other question. So, and that's, that's where the notion of externalities come in. So if we look at page 512, all right, here it says the external cost of energy use. It says an externality, externality can be defined as the cost and benefits, benefits which arise when the social or economic activities of one group of people have an impact on another. When we did, um, when we looked at Fukushima, remember we looked at the radioactive iodine creeping its way across the Pacific, so the energy technology practices and misfortune of Japan had an economic impact on California. Everyone ran out and bought a bunch of iodine so they didn't get uh, radioactive iodine in their bodies. Same thing too, I mean, you, you could sort of look at uh, the manufacturing sector in the United States that's moved a lot of our manufacturing to China, you know, away, away from the United States because labor is cheaper in China. Well, who deals with that? The, the, the people of Beijing then deal with the pollution that our offshore manufacturing practices have, have brought. So that's an examples of externalities. Somebody else pays for it. You know, you, and, and typically there are, you know, three parties involved at a, at a minimum. There's the consumer, you know, buying the manufactured good. There's the manufacturer who's put the plant somewhere. And then there's the, the third person who kind of gets the short end of the stick. Okay. Um, I think we spent a little bit of time doing carbon conversions. Uh, it says, as explained in box 5.3, we've got the atomic weight of, of carbon. Let's take another look at that. When you, when you take Brian Kern's uh, 241 and, and 244, you'll see more of this, but this is just a very simple stoichiometry problem. If, if we've got carbon coming in, at uh, 12 atomic units. So again, if you remember, carbon's got uh, six protons, six neutrons, and uh, six electrons. And so this, where's this carbon? Well, it's in coal, it's in natural gas, it's in oil, it's in biofuels, it's in garbage, if you will. Um, carbon, it's everywhere and you burn it or pyrolysize it or torrify it or, you know, heat it in some way, attach a oxygen molecule to it. And remember, um, oxygen is uh, it's 16, so it's got eight protons, it's got eight neutrons, and it's got eight electrons. And it turns out this, this Diatomic oxygen is more stable in the atmosphere than um, monoatomic oxygen. So that's your basic combustion process. Heat comes off. Radiation, phonons, photons, all kinds of good stuff come off of that. And then you've got CO2. So you've got 12 plus uh, 16 times 2. 32 gives you atomic an atomic mass of 44. So a lot of times some will say we've got carbon pollution or carbon dioxide pollution. Kind of two different things because if you if you think back to your summary three, um, the amount of mass coming off of a combustion product is more than is more than the solid. So this is your um, solid coming in. Obviously this is a gas. This is also typically a gas. I heard earlier today that there are some um, enhanced geothermal, I wish Tynan were here to share this with him, some en enhanced geothermal technologies where you use your um, solar and you use your wind to make electricity to run pumps to liquefy your CO2. Now it's much more dense. Now you've got liquid CO2. Your liquid CO2 is now a fantastic 
refrigerant. It, it's, it, it is now your um, uh, heat transfer media. So, you know, rather than using just, just water, which could, you know, freeze in the winter, or glycol, uh, which you would want to drink, for example, um, it might have, you know, toxicity issues of its own. Now you've got um, liquid CO2, which could go through a thermodynamic loop in a, in a heat cool cycle, and now you're sort of putting it to use. So this would be the, the U in a CCUS um, system. Anyway, whenever you're doing this sort of carbon mathematics, you kind of have to look at the ratio of, you know, carbon being up here with 12 and CO2 being down here with 44. So if someone says, um, I've got 44 tons of CO2 in the air, well, what's that mean? It means that you pumped uh, 12 tons of carbon into it. So that's your sort of accounting method. So keep, keep that in mind. Um, another one that's mentioned in this box is this uh, CO2 equivalent. Uh, CO2 equivalent. And so, for example, and I'm, I'm not going to dig up the numbers. I know they're back in the, in the coal chapter. But uh, let's just say eight, you know, X megajoules of coal is going to result in um, Y uh, tons of CO2 equivalent. It basically means if I burn enough coal to make this many megajoules, this many tons of carbon is going to come out. But if I take the same amount, X megajoules of uh, natural gas, I'm going to get Z tons of CO2 equivalent, which is greater, Y or Z, if I'm burning natural gas versus coal, for the same amount of energy. I've got Y here, and I've got Z here, and I've got to do this or this. I told you natural gas was cleaner. We have more or less CO2. Cold. Yeah, you'd have less. So, uh, so Z is going to be smaller than Y. So for a for so CO2 equivalent for a certain number of megajoules, natural gas is going to be a cleaner carbon fuel. That's uh, really where you know that's why uh, fracking is what it is right now, um, and we're, we're seeing a you know, a big, big drop, um, big drop in, in natural gas prices. Okay, this is a term I am not that familiar with, so I'm just going to read it from the book. It says, the damage done by the emission of a ton of pollutant can be expressed as a shadow price, uh, which is a notional sum of money that can be entered into financial calculations in order to make investment decisions. Okay, so I'm going to write that up here. Because this is another thing. Um, in fact, Wayne was just having this informal conversation about his lucrative roofing shingling business, and he had a very bumper year when there were a lot. There was a lot of hail and wind, right? So, so someone's misfortune of losing their roof is the roofer's fortune. Uh, so, and and I'm I'm sure th there are uh, growthists out there who would say, "Hey, bring on the climate change. We'll build the wall around New York City, no problem." Um, what was that movie that just came out? Uh, Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim. Yeah. They built a huge wall around all the oceans because yeah. this alien creature comes up out of a portal from the ocean. Yeah, it was basically, yeah, it was like a Godzilla thing, but yeah. uh, on the other hand, I, th I think we knew what Godzilla was, right? It was, yeah, climate change, etc. So, anyway, shadow price. Um, so, shadow price is the estimated price of a good or service for which no market currently, no market price exists. Yeah, right. Um, but it's, yeah, so, but, it, but it's still there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just like your shadow. It, it, it's still there. Um, 
I, I, I guess I kind of see it as a cleanup cost, uh -huh. you know, that we that we haven't really uh, figured out. I have a question for the yeah. burn on me. It Please. kind of has something. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. Who named Earth Earth? From whence did the name Earth? You Earth? know, I want to say it's Greek, but I don't know. Why? I'm just curious. Yeah. It's, it's curious you ask because I've got a buddy who wants to um, trademark a name with the word Earth in it. And. I guess you can do that, you know, pay the trademark office a few hundred bucks and you can't, I don't think you could trademark the word Earth, but you could trademark a, uh, a play on that, so. Earth first. Earth first, is that, yeah, so, yeah, I, I do not know. Uh, language is a, it's a tricky and evolving thing itself. So I, I don't know who's decided on the word Earth for the English language. I, I want to just say Greek. Okay, let's do one more figure. This is kind of a long section. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop through. Gosh, this is a nice, beefy section. Isn't it? Um, I'm going to hop through a, a few little figures here, and then we, we will get to as much of the rest of this as we can. This, this chapter is just loaded. Loaded. Okay, um, I have sat with the with the folks in the facilities. We 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 have a sustainability officer. Her name is Eva Rocky. It used to be Sherry Peacock. And when we're looking towards carbon neutrality, graphs like this come out. So let's just look at lighting right there, very far left. What we can see is that the um, the abatement cost is, the cost benefit is quite good in, in terms of you're going you're gonna to put your money in now, put your lights in, and a lot less CO2 comes out because you still got plenty of light, but you're not, make, you know, not burning as much fossil fuels. On the other hand, you know, take, a, take a look off to the right. Um, those are, those are Developments. So you're actually going to go and, on the very far right, retrofit your combined cycle gas plant, and it's going to it's going to cost you. Um, yeah, it's going to it's going to it's going to cost you a bunch of money up front. Um, down the road, you'll get it back. So right somewhere right in the middle is is kind of the, the break even. But they're all on the table. You no, know, we aren't. Us right here in, in our GY one hundred and one aren't the first people to think about that. So all options are on the table. Rice management. What is that? Waste management. That's what we're going to do. Rice. Oh, rice. Oh, rice is just taking the non-edible portions and um, turning them either into agricultural products or energy. And right now, it's just what's going away. It's. You know, it just depends on the region. We, we've actually got a, um, a an agreement going with some almond manufacturers in California that have, I don't know, 50,000 tons of almond shells a year that they are not allowed to burn, that they want to ship to Montana to have us turn into fertilizer. So, again, so similar similar notion. Rather, you know, the, the leftovers from agriculture. Could be rice, could be almonds, could be just you name it. In fact, in China right now, the number of labs with different agricultural waste energy, it's just, it's going gangbusters. It's going crazy. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what Nancy was working on. Oh, is she? The seafood, the shallow Oh, all oh, right, yeah, yeah. The, um, like, uh, the chitin? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, neat. I did, I did a tiny bit of work on the, on the chitin as well. Okay, so stages of the fuel chain for electricity, for a coal-fired power plant, looking at impacts, uh, mining, washing, drying, transport, power plant, uh, emissions. This is to get one, uh, one passenger kilometer of an um, electric car versus a petroleum-powered car. So you've got oil 
there at the bottom. Um, on the top, what we're seeing is coal mining and processing, all the pollutants. So you've got methane, NOx, uh, particulates heading off in the air. You also have some groundwater issues. You have additional air pollutants when it's transported, and then a lot more when the plant is under operation. That's just to make electricity. So that's a, what's called a fuel chain analysis. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, some Japanese scientists who did this for Japan, like the country, the whole thing. It was, it was, it was pretty impressive for all of their energy and all their fuel, like just giant arrows flowing and then sort of like, you know, where is it going to be in the future? The other thing too, um, I learned from this gentleman I met yesterday, and this will be my last thing, we'll, we'll wrap it up here, but um, his advice was rather than sitting around wringing your hands about what's going on in the present, he said just put, put yourself five or ten years in the future, you know, and envision where you want to be, what you want to be doing, what you want your town, your state, your planet to look like, and then just look backwards to now, and the, your, your, your pathway to get to where you want to be in the future will, will suddenly become much easier and clearer rather than like fretting and worrying. And uh, it's a pretty interesting, I, you know, I, I can't, it's one of those philosophies like, haven't I heard that before? But I don't think I had. <laughs> it seems like you should have. Seems like you should have, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I've got an important meeting tomorrow and a call coming mm -hmm. coming in. So, um, when you're speaking with these, like, you know, Japanese economists and all yeah. that, do they do they typically, by and large, know English, or do you have to have like a translator? Or? Oh, these um, English is so ubiquitous, and and almost anybody who's in academia in Asia or Europe is going to speak English. Really? Yeah. It makes it easy for you, huh? Yeah. It's just, I mean, English has become the what. French used to be, and what Latin was before that. I think nice. English is the universal scientific language. Yeah. So how do you do that one question? The uh, the question where you got to figure out how many uh, hertz it is, where you got 60 full cycles in a second and 120 reversals. Uh huh. How many hertz is that? I was looking at the equation in the book, and I couldn't figure out how to get to do it. Oh well. Um, Six, 60 full cycles and 120 reversals in one second is 